I, uh, I'm privileged to be here. And if he thinks I'm one of the smartest people he knows, he mustn't know very many people then. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, he, he's kind because I'm, I'm not one of the people who thought up a lot of the great ideas. But uh, 30 years ago, a uh, little 32 years ago, I thought up the idea of we should probably write it down somewhere. Some way of knowing uh, sort of the book of Genesis and so on, you know, who begot whom and where did it come from. And uh, when I started at it, um, computer security was called, uh, com uh, actually it was, yeah, it's probably called computer security at that time. And there were three or four organizations that were arguing about who it belonged to. And being a true dyed-in-the-wool academician, I said, it doesn't belong to any of us. It belongs to everybody. And we need to do something about that. And so I brought together mm, six other organizations to my university. And for those of you who don't know where Idaho State is, it's where you go if you're lost going to Yellowstone. It's in the middle of nowhere. And uh, we brought them out there, and that was my method of determining that they were interested in what was going on. If they were willing to come all the way to Idaho in the winter, that was a good sign. And there wasn't time for them to go skiing. So uh, we, we worked on that a little bit. And we got them finally to agree that they would take whatever work they were doing to define the part of the discipline that they saw, and that we would, we, my graduate students and I, would sort of put it together, put a, codify it in some way or another. And how many of you ha have a CISSP? Uh, my apologies. I, I, I wrote the original CBK documents, and they were more or less designed to catalog things not be used as a study guide. And we've proven that the stuff that comes out of it is not suitable for studying. You should probably know it uh, when you get there. And Spaff, somewhere along this line, was a graduate student at Georgia Tech. And he and I were at a set of meetings together where he is a dyed-in-the-wool computer scientist. And he was saying, oh, no, 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 no. There must be more structure to this somewhere. And I said, first, let's just get it down on paper. We'll worry about structure later. I have a high tolerance for chaos. Entropy follows me around. And uh, we, we finally got it put together in such a way that we could agree. And, and Spaff ended up being a pretty good expert based on his dissertation uh, on uh, firewalls. But he had one other little talent. He really liked talking to Congress. He liked talking to politicians. And he, w he did a little study. One of his first papers was on the Morris worm, doing the economic analysis of the Morris worm. And I tease him about this a little bit because doing the economic analysis does not sound like a computer science task. But we, we got through that and we, we built a bunch of things. But he was the one who pointed out almost anybody in the world is turning out more PhDs in computer, science, computer security than the United States was. He could maybe find half a dozen, maybe a dozen on a good, good year. And he said, you know, this stuff is probably going to be important. I said, yeah, that's why I got involved. And he would go down and testify to Congress. And he would say, we need to be putting money into this. And long story short, we ended up uh, being, getting a little bit going on. We'll talk about some of that. Because this isn't a story about what the US has done. It's about what we have done, what all of us have done. I have philosophic differences with almost everybody I meet, 
but they pale by comparison to the philosophic differences that Spath and I have. And we were originally going to stand on this stage without slides and talk for an hour, un unrehearsed other than knowing the general direction. When I discovered he wasn't going to be here, I thought, the first thing I thought of doing was putting an empty chair up here on the stage and saying, Spaff, we'll, we'll talk to you and, and you'll be silent for the first time I've known you. <laughs> but we, we decided we wouldn't do that to him. And so that's why this is the birth of a discipline. Perhaps it's been observation from two midwives about what it was and why we did it. And I wish I knew which end of this was the front. So this slide will either go backwards or forwards. So some things we need to talk about. As it is with every program of a theater I've been to, they, they always list the dramatic personae, the people who are there. And what I did was I pointed out today's performance by Spath. Uh, he, since he's not well, he will, will be extemporaneously done by me and anybody else, here in, anybody else here in the audience that wants to talk to me about things or disagree with me. And if that doesn't work, I'll call on uh, Wim. Uh, Roger Scow, who's in your program, isn't going to be here either because I'm Corey. I don't know who Roger is, but uh, we, we will go from there. I do point out the opinions expressed may not represent anybody in particular, particularly not Spath, because he does disagree with me. Nice opportunity to get ahead a little bit. And if you don't like the show, blame Roger. If you like it, thank you very much. So, oh, by the way, that's a picture of Spath taken about 30 years ago as he was falling asleep in the meeting that he was running on. Uh, so we, you know, but what do you want when you've got a room full of computer scientists, right? They, they, were, they were doing pretty well. Anyway, this is a view out my back window. Actually, it's the same view out my front window, basically. I live in the middle of nowhere. And everybody who does things with computers where I am uh, says, we don't have to worry, we're in the middle of nowhere. There's a major national laboratory only 60 miles from where I live, and their entire defense 25 years ago was based on the fact that, well, anybody would notice a stranger coming into town. And I'm not sure that that's really the way we want to do things. But that's the middle of nowhere, and they basically took the defense posture of a, an ostrich who puts his head in the ground and puts his vulnerable parts up in the air. It's a, it's a wonderful defense that they have. So I have a quiz for you. First one is, what's that? Don't have to answer yet. Second one is, what's that? Here's the quiz question. What do they have in common? Anybody got, anybody got a guess? Say again? Yeah, they're silicon tools, but more importantly, they're silicon tools that can kill you. Everybody recognizes the arrowhead. They know that that one's dangerous. But a lot of the people who we worked with and tried to teach and so forth don't recognize the stuff on the left is actually where the real danger to what we have exists. And I'm not going to give you the cyber Pearl Harbor FUD lecture now, but that's where this one would normally lead. It's so that I can talk to managers about why they should be interested in learning something about computer security. Um, I will say information assurance. And I have a problem with the term cyber security because cyber Prepended to something does not make it magic. It's like Apple thinking if they put an eye in front of something, it makes it magic. Well, people putting who do that bother me a little bit, but we, we have the issue we can get ahead here. This is from an ACM article that I did last year. Um, title of it was Plus c'est chance, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. That's for those of you who think my French is atrocious. But 
that's actually a cartoon showing Spath and myself together. Um, the question that we were asked to address in the article, and we were originally going to write two separate ones, and ended up, mine got published, his didn't, so I was going to let him tell me what he was going to say here. But uh, the question we were asked is, does computer security, cybersecurity, information assurance, does the education of it require depth or breadth? And I have an extremely bad habit. If you ask me an or question, I will almost always say yes, because XOR is an unimplemented instruction in English. And so we talk about it. And so it really is yes. And the, the elephant in the background is the old story, and I tell it in the, in the article a little bit, about the fact that you have to, the only way you can swallow an elephant is in little pieces. But the other one goes back to the story of a group of blind men come across an elephant, and they all start touching it. And one says, oh, elephants look like tree trunks. Others say, it looks like a rope. The other one turns up at the other end and says, it's a hose. No two of us could agree on what information assurance or computer security or cybersecurity really is. It's big. But I can tell you, if you look in the bushes, there are a bunch of eyes staring out at you. Welcome to the audience. There are people who look and have things that they want to, to deal with. Part of the, that article talks about this quote from Heinlein. So the statement is, specialization is for insects. A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, coin a, uh, con a ship, design a building, etc. A list of 10,000 things, but think about it. If you're in information assurance and, or computer security, your boss, unless he happens to be one of us, thinks that you can do all of those things at once. And those are your other duties as assigned. Those aren't your primary task. But that's what Heinlein said. And the fact is, if you think about insects, the thing that makes them viable is that they are extremely specialized. The thing that makes them also very vulnerable is that they are very specialized. If you can find one case that you can go after, you can kill all of them. They have a common flaw. It's called Windows. So, let me ask you a question. Uh, can anybody see, do you know what those are? They're from a set of paintings discovered about three years ago in southern France, near Lesco. And those if you look at them closely, they're basically a, rhino a rhinoceros. These are older than the ones in Lascaux by several thousand years, but they're rhinoceros. rhinoceros. What are these? Those are cats. The rhinoceros, it's a herbivore. The cats are, uh, are carnivores. One of the things that you need to think about is that the relationship that you're seeing here is this, that cats are always hunting the herbivores. And when I talk to people who are not part of our profession, I talk about it in terms of you guys are the rhinoceros, you guys are the giraffes, you guys are the prey for anybody who thinks they're a cat. It's an important lesson for them to have because notice if you look at the eyes that the that, that people put together for these cave paintings, they really focus, they're staring at one thing. Think about how we work on solving problems. We take a tight focus. We become highly specialized in what we attack because the people we're attacking are even more specialized. Maybe they just use windows. Gee, if I can compromise one case of windows, I perhaps have compromised all cases, just like how I kill insects. So, in our jobs, some of us look like this. 
We're juggling everything. We're throwing things into the air. We're trying to figure out which one's important. We're trying to prioritize things. We look at risk. We look at all sorts of things. In fact, there's something that we look at that I bet you we can't define necessarily. I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands or ask anybody in particular, but what I am going to do is, in your head, can you put together your 10 threats that you would keep you awake at night? Build that little list for just a minute in your head. Because if you're juggling all of these, you have to think about it. Now, if I stop you, think about the list. If I say, I would bet a fair amount of money that the majority of you will have come up with vulnerabilities, not threats. Because it's easier to focus on vulnerabilities. If we know what a vulnerability is, we know how to deal with it. We are the threat. But what are, what are the threats that are out there? Years ago, I was in a very large audience and was asked to talk about computer security. I had about 1,500 people in the room. And I, was, I walked out, and I'd been introduced, and there was this beautiful blue screen behind me with a bunch of people kneeling down behind the, the, the altar or the lectern saying prayers to the computer. And I figured that's what they were doing. And so I came up to the front like I'm doing now, and I talked with them about things, and I said, you know, folks, um, this will be fixed in a minute, I hope. And came back a minute or two later, I said, hey, as long as we're sitting here doing nothing, let me ask you a couple of questions. How many of you teach the first or second course in computer science at the university that you're at? Because they were all academicians. Everybody held up their hand. Yeah, they all, everybody gets, gets to do that course. And I went back, still had a blue screen, came back, got another question for you folks. Uh, amongst those of you who uh, teach that, uh, that course, what software do you use? And they said, well, um, and I pointed at people. I walked out into the audience, stuffed a microphone in their face, and said, hey, what are you using? And most of them were using something from Microsoft. The rest were using some Linux derivative uh, and one or two other odd things, which I pointed out to them were varietal Unix, but that's okay. And uh, I said, well, how many of you had the chance would get rid of the dog, uh, not the dog food, the, uh, the Microsoft stuff and use Linux? And I said, almost all their hands went up. That, that, that's a good point you've made there. Uh, why don't you want to use the Microsoft stuff? Too many bugs, full of bugs. Good point, good point. I, I wouldn't want to teach with buggy software. Do you happen to know what the largest single flaw in Microsoft software was at that time? Anybody got a guess? Some variety of a buffer overflow. So I asked them again in the group, how many of you in your first or second course teach computer science majors that buffer overflows are bad and that range checking is good and there are a bunch of other things that you can do? Out of that group of 1,500 people, there were a couple of dozen liars, and about six people said that they do it. And that was it. I said, well, you blame Microsoft for it. Where do you think Microsoft gets their programmers? They get them from us. And if we're not teaching them the right way to start with, who are we to complain? We're going to have to live with the dog food because we're the folks that are actually producing the materials that go into the dog food we don't like. I was waiting for somebody to come up with a pitchfork and a torch and come after me because I had obviously hit a nerve because I was telling him, we have met the enemy and he is us. They didn't like that very much. Um, thank goodness, finally somebody said the right prayer, the screen lit up and I got to go on with my rather boring set of PowerPoints. But that's what your job is. You're constantly looking at that. Now there's another approach. By the way, for those of you who know Steve Hernandez, that's his wife. 
in that cartoon. Um, because she's also a computer security person. This one you may also recognize. The other approach is you're a one-man band. You try to do it all at once. That's not a really good solution, because eventually you run out of the three tunes that you can do with a one-man band, and so you have a problem with it. But if you get a little more sophisticated, what you're able to do is you can put together a little combo. You put together the guys, four guys who've got tuxedos, and they can play a little bit of music, and they wait tables on the side. A lot of places you ask your waiter, me particularly on the West Coast, hey, uh, your waiter or waitress, uh, what do you do? Well, I wait tables between roles. Yeah, well, that's what people end up doing. But you begin to get a little specialization here. And, it, and it's good. And you can work with that specialization a little bit. But the real trick is, if you want it to work well, you have to come up with some way that you can make it grow. And that doesn't grow very well. A four-piece combo does not become a band. It does not become an orchestra. And no matter how well they do it, if it were a band of everybody that was alike, everybody playing the kettle drum, Ode to Joy, Beethoven's Ninth, would not sound very good, performed by 700 people on kettle drums. So you've got to have the diversity. And the role that we need to have people think about, no matter how much you hate the management role of things, you've got to be able to get to this point where you're the conductor standing in front, trying to get everybody to go in the same direction. And everybody's playing a different instrument. And they're all doing things that are different, and you've got to be able to deal with all of that simultaneously. Good, I did get to the right slide. Uh, so, when we look at things, what we're really looking at is we're dealing with systems that are interdependent. And when you look at it at the governmental level, and I've spent a lot of my life talking to governments around the world about what they need to be doing, everybody misses that little block in the middle. Everybody recognizes, oh, I didn't push the button yet, sorry about that, folks, that industry has a bunch of diverse stuff. And over on the other side, government has a bunch of diverse stuff. And this little piece in the middle is what may tie them all together. We sometimes do not make great use of our academic resources because they can deal with both research and they can deal with education. Now, some of my best friends don't have a formal education. They came into this community, into this business, into this discipline by plowing the field, by working very hard. But there has to be some place in between where people can do it, and academia is the part that brings it together. I constantly, as an academician, compete with industry. They'll find one of my sophomores, my second year students, and they'll say, hi, how would you like to get more money than your professor every year for the rest of your life? And I don't get a percentage if they say yes or no. And so, you know, they, they usually will say, yeah. And I do the same thing with government. I'm constantly competing with them. Because if I can get them to stay long enough in what I do, they'll teach the next generation. We, as a community, are eating our seed corn. We are, in fact, not always thinking things through. One of the things which I was able to do was get the US government to agree to provide scholarships for people who were willing to be tortured for a couple of, uh, learn some stuff for a couple of years and move on and work for the US government for just two years. And then they can go do other things. They get paid a whole lot more than I do once they make that move. And that's part of what we're looking at here is how do we get government and industry and academia all to get together to build things? Let's talk about some of the pet peeves that I come up with. First one is a magnificent invention of, of industry worldwide, the cat dog. 
Uh, sometimes it's also a cow that says moof. But it, it's one of those things that has come up. How many of you recognize a job description that would be called a programmer analyst? They occur. People who are out there do both. Problem with it is that the analyst side of that brain will never come up with anything that is more complicated than the programmer side of their brain knows how to do. If you separate those two roles, you then come up with a way that you are able to make sure that people build better solutions to problems than just their own programming skill. So we want to avoid cat dogs when we can. Another quiz question. It's a definition. Do you know what that defines? Eh. Okay. I'll tell you the answer to that is it defines science. Grab from the Wikipedia and from a couple of other places. Would we all agree that mathematics is probably a science? Yeah. Well, except for an economist who couldn't agree whether something was black or white. But, yeah, mathematics. How about physics? You think physics is a science? Most people would agree. How about this one? Political science. Is that a science? Something we need to think about is what do we really want to be science? What is the scientific part of what we look at? It has to meet that first part of the definition. Yesterday, uh, after I arrived, I was talking to someone and they were talking to me about metrics, all sorts of nice metrics. And listen for a while, despite the fact I will talk for an hour straight here, I actually do listen. And they finally wound down a little bit and I said, well, tell me what a metric is for that. There was a moderately long silence because we use the word metric when it might mean measurement, it might not, and it might be qualitative, it might be quantitative. And, and so, something we need to think about. I, I would argue with you that any discipline that needs to include science in its name probably isn't a science yet. And that's this argument. Computer science really isn't a science. They, they claim it is, excluding people who get real interested in formal methods, which is mathematics probably anyway. When was the last time, and when was the last time you saw reproducible experiments being done by computer scientists? I spent a year going through absolutely everything by IEEE and by ACM for a 10 year period excluding some things that floated in out of the social sciences, I could find nothing that met the first part of this definition. In fact, that's the main portion of the definition. There are parts, uh, I'm sorry for swearing in front of you, but there are parts of economics that might be science. There are parts of anthropology that might be science, but for the most part, I'm sorry, we don't have that science. So one of the things we have to think about is how do we combine that with something else? Software engineering. Software engineering, software engineering. It's a euphemism for computer science in some programs. But engineering is characterized by having standards about what it does. The fact that years ago, the Tay Bridge fell into a body of water in Scotland was a matter of, it was very well built, it was very well designed. Only problem is they didn't understand that iron becomes brittle over time, particularly when it's cold. And that bridge failed catastrophically and instantaneously. And a train full of people went into the water. So when we think about it, I put this picture up. This is uh, a bridge in uh, Spain. It was built by the Romans 1,500 years ago. 
they had science of engineer, or they had the discipline of engineering down to a science. What they did was, you know those Roman legions that wandered around and head bashed and wife stole or whatever else they were doing? They were actually engineering battalions that happened to be able to fight. And what they did was, if they needed a bridge, they built a bridge. If they needed a road, they built a road. And they had a very good way of building bridges. The engineering battalion would put it together, and they'd take everybody that had worked on it, put them down underneath the bridge, and run twice its rated load across the top of them. It gave them a very, very strong interest in what they were doing. I teach a course in software engineering. I might as well be teaching a course in how to run a Ouija board, because there really aren't standards, there's folklore. And I can tell them lots of folkloric stories, but it doesn't make them any better. And it leads them to use a word which I rather like, which is called resilience. I like resilient systems. But in fact, going back to the Tay Bridge, I'm really more interested in having systems that are not brittle. I would, I think, prefer one that would not fail catastrophically and unexpectedly to one which I could get restarted after it had fallen down. Somehow the Roman legion might not have liked that idea very much. Here's another one. And this one, Spath and I were going to talk through a lot. We were going to show the uh, little piece from Monty Python. Bring out your dead, bring out your dead. And uh, sort of an interesting piece because Part of what we're seeing here is 14th century, on through for a couple hundred years, 60% of the European population died because of the Black Death, bubonic plague. And there were lots of theories about it. Bad air. Maybe it was smoke coming from fires in Central Asia. Or maybe starting a fire would make it go away. They referred to these things as miasmas some way of making these things happen. And maybe it was uh, first time I read the, it says evil fog. First time I read it, it was evil frogs. And I couldn't quite decide how it was going to be. Uh, but it was talking about whatever this air was, was bad. And the, uh, the Pope in Rome blocked up all the windows in his residence and moved far away from the city of Rome. And uh, he died. But uh, there, there was something that was called a blue mist, something else called a yellow mist. And these miasmas of various forms were all being blamed. And they were shouting at people who said they were scientists, alchemists, who said, um, we must do something. Now, Here's where Spaff and I were going to set you up a little bit. I gotta let you, I'm, li I'm like a magician. I'm gonna have to let you in a little bit on the trick. We're gonna lead you down a bit of a path because what happens at this point is you're gonna do something. And the experiment that I might have proposed was let's capture some of the blue mist and take it north of where we are because we could see this coming up from the south and turn it loose and see if people die. And uh, we'll take some of this bad air and we'll release it and see what happens. And at some point, I might get down to the point of taking some rats and some fleas and moving them north. And you know what would happen? People would start dying where the rats and the fleas went. And then I'd turn around to the burgers of the city and I would say, you know, I have found a vulnerability in your system, and it could be blue mist, it could be yellow mist, it could be red mist, it could be a lot of things. And I'll tell you what it is if you'll pay me, and I'll tell you how to get rid of it. Hmm. Does this sound like an economic model that we've heard about? Gee, we'll, we'll go out and we'll fix things for you that we've found. The, the part that I, I really want to make here is that as academicians and as practitioners, do you think we might get along a little better fixing the dog food 
by going back and saying, we need to have the next generation of people who are going to be programming and designing these systems be people who put security in from the beginning and that we use some of the efforts that we have to playing with very, and I watched some very clever papers yesterday, but for, for, for finding those and actually try to teach people how to make it so they don't make the mistake in the first place. Just think, if somebody had figured out that getting universities to teach students not to do buffer overflows would have made Microsoft's software perhaps marginally better, it'd be a trick to make it worse, so you didn't have much to lose. And by the way, I was standing on the stage and I was working at Microsoft Research when I gave that talk about why you should be doing it the other way. I got a stern talking to about don't go off script. But we must do something. One way we do it is we stop performing experiments on live cultures. Yeah, I know. It takes all the fun out of it, but we got to think about it. So, here's the other part. Looking at this room, I, I, I'm I would suspect probably the oldest guy in this room. Um, I'm real big on being a change agent, though. And when you look at that, that picture, I was on a Fulbright Fellowship in New Zealand. And that picture was taken by a guy from the newspaper. And I, I rather like the picture. I don't know who the guy who was standing in for me was. It's probably Roger Scow. But um, it, was, it, it was nice. He said, that's the one we're going to put. You're the, the Fulbright scholar. You're the one who we want to have there. And I said, no, no, you have it all wrong. My colleague is the one who needs to be in this picture. Because that's where the future of what we're doing is. He's probably 30, 40 years younger than I am. But that's where it is. And we have to accept the fact that we need to start working. With, he, he's a professor at University of Waikato in New Zealand. But we as a profession have to start even getting them earlier and teaching them good habits. I could fill every classroom in my building if I taught a course system cracking for fun and profit. Everybody would sign up for the class. And it wouldn't even have to be very good. It'd just have to have that title, and people would sign up for it. But somehow or another, I can't convince the accounting department to also offer a course on embezzlement for auditors. It just, they, they, they don't see the parallel. But that, if we stop and we think about it, that is the parallel. So, one of the other parallels that we have to be able to deal with is getting these people into it. And it's something that my program does. Remember I said I like breadth over depth? I do a master's program. It's a two-year computer security master's degree and a two-year MBA at the same time. And they have to work 35 hours a week in my lab. Now, that usually requires permission from their spouse to be gone for two years because it's, it's an intense program. But that's my attempt to get back to, let's get this to the next generation down. They actually, as part of what they do in their spare time, they go out and find high schools and junior high schools and teach the kids how to do little things. Mostly how to secure a system. Because here's my other pet peeve. So that I could afford to stay in academia, particularly at a time when people did not entirely appreciate the computer security part of what I was doing and the fact that I had a Rosetta Stone for it a little bit, I developed full motion flight simulators for airlines from the ground up. Designed all the training systems that went with it. And it, I was a typical consultant. 
you do know what defines a consultant. It's somebody who will tell you what time it is using your watch. And what I would do is I would work with them and they would build systems. But while doing it, I discovered something that was very interesting about it. How you teach pilots. When you ask a pilot how you want to teach a pilot, he's going to tell you something that usually involves the Red Baron. Leather helmet, goggles, white scarf around your neck flying. If you haven't learned to fly that way, you're not going to be able to fly an airplane. And I said, well, we're going to work on that problem a little bit. And we, we would build simulators that would, in fact, at least in one occasion, get a very startled pilot to void his bladder because he realized that he was going to crash. He was extremely upset by, by the experience he was having. But what I did determine was, you don't teach a pilot to make good landings by teaching him 10,000 ways to crash an airplane and ask him to abstract from that one really, really good way of landing it. It might be doable, but that's not actually how people learn. And so a lot of what we do, we do a lot of, in my program, we do a lot of not ranges, we do simulations. We're getting pretty good at it. Large scale simulations. And the other part, and we're, by the way, we're also reaching out into, industri into uh, industrial control systems and SCADA systems as well. Um, but we give them one really, really good way to land an airplane and 10,000 variations of what can be done the wrong way. We're not teaching them to crash it. We're saying, hey, you know, sometimes you're going to run out of speed, altitude, and good ideas, and that's called a crash. And we're going to try to get you to the point where you don't have the tendency to do the wrong thing. That's nowhere near as interesting as going out and tearing the covers off something. But it's the one that we sort of need to spend a little time with. And so what do I do for a red team? Well, one of my colleagues said, well, how are they getting this? Because they're, they're not getting any real experience. I said, oh, you would be surprised. I use a lot of my alumni to come and attack things because maybe they're working at a company that does things like that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's called pen penetration testing. I forgot the right word for it. Uh, but they're, they're out doing penetration testing for a living. So I, I use them. But you want a really good red team? Just take down the firewall in front of the simulator and set it out on the curb for about five minutes. I'll have more red team people in it than I can imagine. All voluntary. And we do that from time to time. We set it out. We put the live simulators out there. One is I can get them back up and running real quickly. And two is they're not going to be detected as a honey net or a honey pot because the timing doesn't change. And they bring it down. And we record everything that went on. Because there's something I learned from a friend of mine that was in signals intelligence. He would fly around and listen to bad guys' radio and communication systems. And what he learned, a basic rule of signals intelligence is, he who lights up first dies. If you're the first one to show what you're able to do, you will be killed. And so the better thing to do is sit there and listen for a while. Just watch what's going on around you. It's something that's called situational awareness. One of the hardest things I can do is convince my students that it would be good for their soul. It would be go good for going back and figuring out how you diaper a baby, because that's part of the problem, remembering Heinlein's piece. But we say, wouldn't it be nice if you knew how to write a piece of code that would go out and do log reading for you? Well, I can go buy something like that. Well, yeah, you can go buy something like that, but are you gonna, which way are you gonna learn more? Oh, you've got to have them working on things that are real. Simulators are real enough that they get a lot of experience. My logbook as a pilot, very interesting, in that I have 
just enough hours to be able to call myself a pilot. My logbook has over 10,000 hours in it. And if I take it down to a fixed base operator to go rent a plane from them, they'll laugh because they'll look at it, you're, you're fudging this, because I've got go oh, about 300 hours flying a 747. And I've got a couple hundred hours in a DC-10. And I've got also, now I've never actually flown one, but the, but the high-end simulators are sufficiently accurate. They have what is called verisimilitude. They look just like the real thing, that pilots can log hours while flying a simulator. And they look at my logbook, yeah, yeah, right, you're nuts. I say, no, actually, that's the way it works. And no, I really don't want to rent your airplane. I just wanted to see your reaction because I'm not a really competent pilot, but I can fly a simulator really well. The only difference is, and the only thing that makes the pilots a little bit right about the white scarf and the, 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 the leather helmet and so forth. Oh, and you got to have the leather jacket too. Otherwise, you're not really a pilot. Is that when you're actually... 10,000 feet above the ground falling at 4,000 feet a minute, you know, that's like standing underneath the Roman bridge. You have to be able to have some skin in the game and haven't really done that part, which is why we set them out. So, points. Remember, don't try to make somebody do two jobs that perform related tasks, have two people doing it. That's not separation of duties. That's more, you're apt to get a better answer. That's what's called by, I've got 10 minutes, thank you. Um, that, that's what's called requisite variety. Shannon and, uh, and Beer uh, talked a lot about requisite variety. Systems that don't have enough variety die. Now, we, we do a lot of that. How many of you know what the CIA is? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That's the one I was referring to, but that's not the way, one that everybody went after. But those three are competing values in a zero-sum game. And the bad guy has an advantage over you. It, it's not that you have to be right every time. You'd like to be. That's what your boss wants you to be. And it isn't that the bad guy needs to be right only once, that's true. But what you're really looking at there is the fact that you don't know what the other guy's payoff matrix is. You don't know what he values. And so as you're doing triage and you're trying to figure out what you want to defend, you're using your own payoff matrix. Maybe the other guy wants something that's completely different than what you're thinking about. You want to have as much variability in the input as you can. Thank you. <laughs>